who get to the airport fairly quickly, so we're going to begin straight away. Uh, it's such a privilege for the Federalist Society to have Senator Mitch McConnell at this morning's proceedings at more occasions than I can possibly count throughout his tenure in Republican leadership. Senator McConnell has staunchly defended the rule of law, and not simply by invoking the platitude, but instead by rising to the floor and challenging his colleagues to think about whether the legislation before them comports with the text and original meaning of our Constitution. He is acutely aware that he and his colleagues have a duty to think about the constitutional validity of their actions and has staunchly resisted the temptation to blindly adopt whatever measures might be popular at the time, leaving the fundamental questions about constitutionality or federalism or separation of powers to the courts. And that takes integrity, forbearance, courage, and a patriotic commitment to our constitutional order. Thank you, Senator, for your example of sound leadership, and thank you for being with us this morning under a very difficult schedule. Well, thank you very much, Leonard, and I, I assume virtually all of you were there last night. I just want to say at the outset that I found uh, last evening absolutely inspiring. And not only was the President's speech uh, magnificent, but having three Supreme Court justices there and retracing the 25-year the history of this marvelous organization was exciting for me and for the Secretary of Labor, my roommate, who was also, uh, <laughs> also with me at the time. <clears throat> As all of you know all too well, 25 years ago, a small group of law students got together to form the Federalist Society, an organization, to paraphrase Lincoln, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men need to read Federalist 78. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Hamilton had confidently predicted in 1788 that of the three branches of government, the judiciary would pose the smallest danger to our rights because judges would have the least ability to disrupt them. But by 1982, that idea seemed almost quaint in most legal circles and on most law school campuses in our country. Yet today, uh, thanks in large part to the Federalist Society's commitment to the Constitution and open debate, Hamilton's vision is being restored. And the original purpose of the judiciary to interpret, not make law, has witnessed a stunning revival in our time. Few people would have imagined in 1982 that a small group of law students with little more than an idea and a reading list could change the illegal culture in this country. There's still a lot of work to do, but I think it's safe to say that when <laughs> that group is today the most active student organization at Harvard Law School, and Yale Law School features a story on its website, as it did this week, entitled, Yale Law School Federalist Society Flourishes. That small group of law students have largely achieved their founding goal. They've changed the legal culture, and we are a much stronger country because of it. So on this 25, uh, 25th anniversary, I want to thank all of you for an extraordinarily uh, well jo uh, job well done, particularly you, Leonard, for your spectacular leadership. And I wanted to come here to talk for a little uh, moment about another branch of government and where we stand today, and that's the legislative branch. Then I have to uh, head to the airport, as Leonard indicated. Otherwise, I'd have been happy to stick around for a few planted questions. <laughs> Now, if you only base your judgment of the current Congress on opinion polls or the ability of the Democratic leadership to carry out even the most basic duties, you might conclude that the legislative branch is in need of the same kind of grassroots reform the judicial branch needed in 1982. But in my view, the Senate, unlike the judiciary, is doing precisely what the Founding Fathers intended it to do. And at this moment in time, conservatives should be pretty darn happy about that. And let me explain. Some of you might have heard that the Senate, uh, the Senate described uh, at one time or another as the place where legislation goes to die. Uh, 
Uh, some would argue that you're looking at the Grim Reaper. <laughs> and in some ways, that's... <laughs> and in some ways, you know, obviously that's the case. The House was designed to be a raucous place where the majority would have considerable power over the minority. And if you walked over, over there today, you'd see that that's uh, pretty much the case. If the Founding Fathers were watching C-SPAN 1 and comparing it to C-SPAN 2, and C-SPAN 1 is a little bit like a continuous food fight, as you know. Uh, things are a little milder over in the Senate, a little calmer. Uh, it's, it's really uh, freewheeling over on the House side. There, the minority thrives on its wits, and my friends over there have done just that in the new uh, Pelosi Congress. The Senate, on the other hand, was uh, designed quite deliberately as a place where things uh, would be tempered, where things would cool down. In fact, in fact, Washington asked at the Constitutional Convention, what's the Senate going to be like? He said he thought it would be like the saucer under the teacup, and the tea would slosh down out of the uh, cup, down into the saucer, and cool off. That's the United States Senate. In short, it's not the kind of place where Dennis Kucinich would dream of working. <laughs> in both houses, the rules are what drive the culture. In the House, a simple majority is good enough uh, to get just about anything through. But in the Senate, virtually anything of consequences requires some kind of bipartisan support. We do, after all, have the 60-vote uh, threshold. On most things, from my, you know, from my perspective as the leader of, by the way, Senator Byrd told the parliamentarian after the Democrats fell into the minority to never use the word minority leader, so we've stricken that from the lexicon in the Senate. I'm the Republican leader. For my job as the Republican leader, that means holding 41 senators together. That's not always as easy as it might seem. Uh, I was the whip before I was a le uh, the leader, and, and I can assure you that it's uh, no small uh, feet, uh, keeping that many class president types heading in the same <laughs> direction. We have no shortage of uh, big egos and sharp elbows. But it is possible. And uh, one of my uh, previous occupants of the whip's office said it was a little bit like trying to keep frogs in a wheelbarrow. You get the drift. Some are jumping out, some are jumping in. <laughs> I'm proud of the job that we've done that this year, and the, the Iraq debate illustrates the point. We just, in fact, have finished having two more Iraq votes uh, right before I came over here. That's what the Congress does this year. We have Iraq votes and investigations. Uh, the, uh, those two made the 63rd, 63rd, I, I do not exaggerate, Iraq vote, House and Senate we've had uh, this year. Over the course of the, uh, the year, the Senate majority has held um, a variety of these uh, votes with all different kinds of stipulations and surrender dates and all the rest. <coughs> We've, um, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you, I can tell you we've beaten them every single time without exception. Well, De, De, Toc De Tocqueville noticed the, the, the differences between the, and the bodies. Um, he, he called it a, a strange uh, contrast. Uh, there are many others uh, we could cite from. Examples, <clears throat> remember the Democrats have been out of power with one minor interruption for 12 years when they took over in January. And over the course of the past year, we've seen the kinds of policies they've been waiting to enact. Even though we have, as I indicated, spent most of our time on Iraq and investigations, I thought you'd be interested in some of the other things they've been up to. Many of their most radical proposals have not uh, caught the attention of many of uh, the American public, and maybe not many of you. But that's because Democrats couldn't find 60 senators who would support them, or because Republicans did a good job of holding uh, 41 of our own. So let me uh, recount some of the things that we've prevented from happening. Early on, they moved to satisfy the liberal interest groups that constitute their base and set their direction. I'm thinking primarily of big labor, trial lawyers, and anti-war fringe groups like Code Pink and MoveOn.org. Anti-war groups that were last seen pouring concrete onto a railroad track to keep supplies from reaching U.S. troops and attacking David Petraeus in the pages of the New York Times. 
The Democrats tried to let airport security workers uh, collectively bargain, which would have given the very people who were hired to carry out rapid response plans in the event of a terrorist attack the power to veto those plans in exchange for longer coffee breaks. Republicans didn't let it happen. They tried to shut down Guantanamo Bay and have its inmates transferred to American soil. Folks in Kentucky are not interested in having these guys living in their backyards. My guess is that the rest of the country isn't keen on the idea either. Republicans didn't let that happen. They tried to eliminate the secret ballot from union elections so workers would have to publicly state in front of the union bosses or employers whether they were for or against forming a union. You know, how would you vote if your boss was looking over your shoulder at the time? The secret ballot is at the heart of our democracy. Senate Republicans were not going to let anyone take it away, and we didn't. <laughs> they tried to revive the so-called fairness doctrine, a kind of federal speech code, mandating that radio stations uh, provide equal airtime for opposing views. <clears throat> this was... Um, done away with, as you all recall, more than 20 years ago because it violated the First Amendment. Well, Senate Republicans didn't let them do it. And now they want to hamstring our ability to monitor terrorists and allow trial lawyers to punish phone companies for helping the government. You might remember that Democrats waited until almost midnight on the day before the August recess to pass the Protect America Act, a bill that was based on urgent and well-considered advice of the Director of National Intelligence. This is a common sense law that says that intelligence officials should be able to listen in on communications between terrorists overseas. Let me say that again. It would allow us to listen in to communications between terrorists overseas. They have a problem with that. We didn't let that happen. But the law expires in February, and Democrats are trying to water down its reauthorization. We will fight against that. But my question is this. If we have this much trouble passing sensible security laws under a president who wants them, what will, secure, what will the security landscape look like under a president who doesn't? In some cases, we've used the rules to shape rather than to stop. One recent example was the Democrats' proposed Internet tax bill. The House passed a bill that would have extended the moratorium on Internet access taxes by four years. Thanks to Senate Republicans, the extension is seven years, and we think it ought to be permanent. Again and again this year, Republicans have used the power of the minority to either improve worthy legislation or to stop legislation that would have never had popular support, but which rose to the top of the Democrats', Democrats legislative agenda at the insistence of various uh, pressure groups, just the kind of thing the framers worried about and why they designed the Senate in the first place. Of course, the founders never intended the minority to block qualified nominees. On this front, Senate Democrats are courting trouble. But despite the best efforts of people for the American Way wing of the Judiciary Committee, we've had some success with nominations, too. President Reagan had the good sense to nominate Michael Mukasey to the U.S. District Court some 20 years ago, and most Americans had the good sense in recent weeks to see him for what he is, an eminently fair jurist who was extraordinarily well qualified to lead the Justice Department at this challenging moment in our nation's history. Yet once again, the Democratic majority let the anti-war left turn the Mukasey nomination into a, quote, controversy. Even the Democrats were caught off guard by their own base elements. Remember, the White House was looking to avoid a fight over the Attorney General position. Judge Mukasey had been suggested by his own home state senator, Senator Schumer. The White House took the suggestion, extended its hand, and the Democrats responded by trying to sink the nominee. Why? Because he was rightly unwilling to prejudge a classified matter on which he had not been briefed. 
Let me say that one more time. <laughs> this nominee became controversial because he was rightly unwilling to prejudge a classified matter on which he had been briefed. And even if he had, we don't need terrorists to know what we will and will not do to protect U.S. citizens from attack. This was an issue driven by the view that if President Bush proposed it, the left will oppose it. Nothing else. Senate Democrats have been sadly short-sighted all year on nominations. We've been engaged in some sharp fights and we've had some hard-fought victories. We confirmed Judge McKay as Attorney General, but I think even more noteworthy was the fact that 40 senators voted against it. That tells you about where Senate Democrats are these days. We confirmed two long-delayed circuit judge nominees, Randy Smith on the Ninth Circuit and Leslie Southwick, to a judicial emergency on the Fifth Circuit that had been vacant since before President Bush took office seven years ago. So the most contentious nomination fights we've won, but again, that's largely because on the issues that draw media attention, Democrats can't hide how out of step their positions really are. Judge Southwick is the poster child for that point. He had participated in some 7,000 cases as a member of the Court of Appeals for the state of Mississippi. They found two cases in which they didn't like the outcome. He wrote the opinion in neither of them. And for that, he was dubbed controversial. You know, the chickens always come home to roost in these situations. And I've indicated to my friends on the other side of the aisle, against the best efforts of myself, and I expect most of the people in this room, there could be a Democrat in the White House again someday. <laughs> and these lessons that they are uh, teaching us are hard to unlearn. And they could potentially reap what they sow. That's not my first choice. I don't think that's the way the Senate ought to operate. But this level of stridency, of radicalism, is bad for the Senate and bad for America. Well, fortunately, we prevailed, and Judge Southwick is busily interpreting rather than making law on the Fifth Circuit. <laughs> this year, the current Senate will be one circuit court nominee short of the number that were confirmed during the next to the last year of the Clinton presidency. And I've been uh, suggesting to my counterpart that in order to have a decent playing field for them, if they were to succeed in next year's presidential election, you need to look at the last two years of each of the last the three presidents, each of whom ended up with a Senate in the opposite party's hands. And the average number confirmed was 17 circuit judges. Clinton was on the low end of that at 15. And that's a goal that I think they would be well advised to meet. Or the lesson will not be unlearned in the future. So a lot has changed since last year's conference when you all were here. Democrats assumed control of Congress. They bought, brought with them 12 years of pent-up uh, liberalism. Yet because the framers had the foresight to anticipate just this sort of thing, a robust Republican minority in the Senate has kept many bad things from happening this year, as well as improved the things that were worth improving. This in many, in many, many ways was what the Senate was made to do. And in these times, we should be darn glad that the United States Senate is doing what it does best. Thank you so much, and congratulations again. <laughs>